welcome everyone to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs, and today I'm jo joined by Jonah Boyarin, Jewish Communities Liaison to the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and vocalist and composer Anthony Russell for a discussion of anti-racist practice and the transformation of Jewish communities. In the weeks following the murder of George Floyd, as protests against racism and police brutality erupted nationwide, Anthony received an invitation to respond to this moment from Jonah. Anthony, a musician and student of Yiddish, was asked to contribute to an initiative translating terms specific to the Black Lives Matter movement into the language. The translation project is one, one example of Jonah's ongoing work to promote racial justice inside and outside the Jewish communal world. In today's program, Anthony and Jonah will discuss their Yiddish translation project in the context of anti-racist practice and what Jewish people can do more broadly to effect positive change in their communities. Anthony Russell is a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in music in the Yiddish language. This work has brought him to Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Boston, Miami, New York, Toronto, Montreal, London, Berlin, Copenhagen, Warsaw, Krakow, Tel Aviv, and Symphony Space in New York and the Kennedy Center in DC. Quite a few destinations. Anthony's <laughs> ongoing project and album Convergence is an exploration of a century of African American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. He lives in Massachusetts from where he is joining us today with his husband of five years, Rabbi Michael Rothbaum. So welcome, Anthony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and Jonah Boyarin uh, is an anti-racist educator and writer, born and raised New Yorker and Yiddish speaker. He co-founded the country's first diversity and equity program at a Jewish day school, uh, the JCHS of the Bay, and currently serves as the Jewish community liaison for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Jonah was named by the Jewish Week as one of 2020's 36 under 36. Welcome, Jonah. Thank you. Um, it's good to have you both. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank our, our partners on today's program, the New York City Commission on Human Rights, the Worker Circle, and Jay Fredge, Jews for <coughs> Racial and Economic Justice. And finally, uh, please note that today's program is being recorded and will be uploaded to the museum's YouTube channel probably tomorrow. I'll send a link to that recording in my follow-up email. And we will also have time for a brief Q&A session uh, at the conclusion of today's program. If you'd like to participate in that, feel free to send in your comments and questions into the chat box. So now I will turn it over to Anthony. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that while the events we're discussing today took place in a period of time, what they represent is an ongoing effort in the face of a phenomenon, which has been with us for a very long time and continues to be with us as evidenced by seven bullets shot into the back of Jacob Blake by a police officer in Kenosha on Sunday. I'd like to think of what we're discussing today as a part of a worldwide movement against police brutality, against systemic racism, using whatever tools we happen to have at hand, whether we are organizers or protesters or athletes on strike, or Yiddishists hashing it out in a Google Doc. We have to use whatever tools we happen to have at hand. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so my first question uh, is about that Google Doc. Can you start by telling us about the origin of the Yiddish translation document? Yoina, you should really start here because it existed before I ever entered the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I got a message from a, a Yiddish student of mine, Hannah Mills, um, around the times of the, the beginning, early peak of the protests in response to uh, the police killing of George Floyd. She said, how do I say Black Lives Matter in Yiddish? And I said, that's a good question. And I realized that, um, you know, for someone like me, for, for whom Yiddish is a living, breathing thing that I read, write, and speak, um, I needed to be able to say Black Lives Matter in Yiddish. I need to be able to, to say it, to, to support it, and also to talk about it, to write about it, um, to work on it. Um, but I wasn't sure how to do it. 
So I reached out to a network of, um, of Yiddishists, a network of people who are in the Yiddish world and I knew were concerned about racial justice. Um, one of the first collaborators was Arun Vishwanath, who uh, also a translator of uh, Harry Potter um, from English into Yiddish, I recommend it. And um, who helped an enormous amount with the language. And uh, one of the other early main collaborators was uh, my friend, Anthony. I reached out to him and said, is this something that you'd be uh, interested in working on? So maybe that, that's where I'll hand it off to you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to read uh, a short sentence from the email that Jonas sent me. It was titled, hashtag base lamed mem af yiddish. Uh, and it was curious kind of uh, receiving this email at that particular time because um, I was about to leave with my husband for a local socially distant vigil in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So I received this email and in it, it said, I thought I'd like to include you because I imagine you might have some strong opinions we benefit from if you want to share. Hashtag two Jews, three opinions. Um, so while it was moving and considerate, of course, to be invited into the development of this document as a black man, it was nice to also have my status as yet another opinionated Jew affirmed um, in this context uh, of this document. So after I got back from the vigil, we had a long conversation where I was apprised of the work uh, that this group of translators had been doing, um, developing vocabulary and phrases in Yiddish to address not only the phenomena of Black Lives Matter as a protest movement, but also the structural phenomena of systemic oppressions the Black Lives Matter movement was addressing. And as we were talking, we very quickly arrived at the challenge of translating the phrase Black Lives Matter uh, into Yiddish and the word black itself because of the potentially pejorative connotations of the most readily available word for black, um, which is uh, Schwarzer or Schwarzer. So, um, before this conversation or the email even happened, I had seen a Twitter conversation a few days earlier where a couple of people were already attempting to translate Black Lives Matter into Yiddish. Um, and their attempts used Schwarze. And personally, it gave me pause, not because I doubted the goodwill of the people engaged in the conversation, not at all, but rather because of the potentially undermining nature of the word in the context of an expression of dignity. Um, I didn't want a phrase that was so important to me personally as Black Lives Matter to be in any way some kind of a joke. And I thought that the use of the word Schwarze, uh, even in this context, opened it up to the possibility of, of being um, undignified. As, as it were. What were your, what were your memories, uh, Yelena, of kind of where we went in this conversation? It was like an hour, I, I remember. Yeah. Um, I think we both knew that this was um, actually a, a difficult lingual question to answer because the history of the use of the word Schwarzer in Yiddish and in what I would call like American Judeo-English um, is, is, is such a, a painful one, a long and difficult and painful one, one that, that, that carries all these loaded meanings of the people we're talking about who can't understand us and often talked about in objectifying like die Schwarzes, the Schwarzes, um, or pejorative terms. And at the same time, for you and I, Yiddish is such a deep resource in history of, of anti-racist activism, of acting for justice. And so we had this kind of contradiction that, that the language itself, we felt, had its, this history of racism that, that made it unprepared for the moment. And at the same time, 
is this incredible resource that would help us prepare much better for this moment to be braver and more disciplined and more committed um, lovers and fighters for social justice like so many Yiddish speakers in the past. Um, and, and I want to say that this issue of finding a way to talk about um, blackness uh, in a way that's not pejorative. It's not an issue that Yiddish has by itself. It's an issue in many languages. It's been a, an issue in the past in English. Um, it's an issue in French. It's an issue in any number of different languages in which um, linguistically the mere existence of Black people was already pejorative. And new language had to be built in order to find a way for people to talk about Black people, but Black people also to talk about themselves that still um, embody their inherent dignity. So I want to be sure to say this is not like necessarily a Yiddish problem. It's a Yiddish problem when Yiddishists have to deal with it, but this is a problem that crops up in many different languages. Thank you for that. Um, Anthony, so you mentioned in the podcast episode you did with The Illusionist back in July, which by the way, I highly recommend to everyone tuning in today. I'll send a link to it in my follow-up email as well. Uh, you mentioned there that you experienced a quote, occupational hazard as a black man who sings in Yiddish. Can you explain to us what you meant by that? I think uh, what I meant by occupational hazard was um, that I meant my effort to find ways of talking about myself in the Yiddish language without undermining uh, or casting aspersions on my own blackness by using terms that fall into the realm of the pejorative. It was an issue for me as a performer, especially at the beginning of my career, just to give you a couple of examples. Um, at my very first performance in Yiddish, uh, somebody was present and they wrote a letter to a friend and that letter somehow got to me about my performance uh, because it was um, highly complimentary, this letter. And in the letter, I was described as der Schwarze Anthony Mordechai Zvi Russell mit ein Oyer Ringel in ein Oyer. Um, the black Anthony Russell with an earring in, in one ear, which is still the case. Um, but I, it was my first time actually interacting with myself in the Yiddish language. So because that was the case, I took this phrase and I used it to describe myself. I would often open performances by saying, my name is Anthony Mordechai Svi Russell, or as I've been called in Yiddish, der Schwarze Anthony Mordechai Svi Russell mit den Oyer Ringeln in Oyer. And there was always this sort of, I don't know, a sort of kind of a frisson in the room uh, where people would laugh because it was, I think it was funny to see a black man referring to himself um, in an ambiguously pejorative sense. And I think that I sensed that there was an ambiguity there as well, but um, because of a lack of confidence as a performer, I sort of embodied that as kind of a part of my performance, almost like I was in on the joke, but I don't really think that I was because I just did not have a vocabulary to really talk about myself. Um, to give you another example, once again, very early in the beginning of my career, I was asked by um, a, a venue to perform the song, uh, Die Grine Cousine, the, the green cousin, green in this case, um, meaning like inexperienced, and as a shtick, like, I said, okay, right now I'm going to sing Die Grine Cousine. I don't know why I'm singing this song. I don't know from a green cousin. I don't know from uh, Die Grine Cousine. I only know from Die Schwarze Cousine. And people thought this was hilarious, which, I mean, it was very much kind of in the model of a particular style of, of Yiddish joke, but it was me sort of pejoratively riffing on uh, the very sort of ambiguous space linguistically I was able to kind of exist in as a black performer of Yiddish. I mean, I think about, you know, me saying like, what do I know from the Green and Cousine? I only know from the Schwarze Cousine. Uh, to use a phrase that the kids use nowadays, it's majorly cringe. It's like, you know, what is that? Um, 
I doubt if someone had asked me at the time, I would have been able to properly explain it. Um, there's been an evolution in the way that I've kind of talked about who I am and what I do in the Yiddish language um, for my project Convergence, which very deliberately combines about a century of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. I usually get up and I describe it as uh, Afro-Americanish Yiddish music, like, you know, kind of blackish Jewish music because um, that felt like the most kind of respectful way of describing who, who I am and what I'm working in without it kind of moving into the pejorative. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Um, this next question is for Jonah. Uh, so Jonah, I know that a while back you co-facilitated a workshop on anti-Semitism and white supremacy for the New York City Commission on Human Rights where you currently serve. Uh, can you tell us how you got involved in social justice work? Yeah, I, um, so it's, it's really, it's nice for me. It's, it's beyond nice. It, it, it feels right for me to be working for the city of New York now um, because it's, it's coming back full circle. I, I was born and raised um, in the Lower East Side. I grew up going to an old immigrant show, well, actually two of them, first the 8th Street show, and then after it was shut down, Stanton Street uh, Synagogue, Rabbi Singer Show. And I grew up in synagogues where I was often the only or one of the only kids. And the culture was 70, 80, 90 year old immigrants from the old country. So I, I kind of grew up at least on Shabbos. My home culture was the old country culture that they had brought with them, including Yiddish. Um, and, and I felt there that, that as, as poor as people were, as much as people had suffered, there were many Holocaust survivors or survivors of Stalin, um, life was with one another. You know, we were, we were always with one another in this really thick cultural uh, way. And at the same time, I, I saw the culture sort of dying around me. I saw... Um, these shows crumbling, we, we couldn't afford electricity, we couldn't afford heat, while meanwhile synagogues, you know, sort of mega synagogues in the suburbs were getting significant funding, we weren't getting barely anything and, and couldn't, couldn't afford to stay open. And, and as, as this was happening, as I saw um, this elderly um, Ashkenazi culture that, that was mine um, dying out, what was replacing it um, was, was gentrification. And, and what was placed, so, so in the 8th Street Shoal, blessed memory, where, where we couldn't afford heat or electricity, there's now a $20,000 a month penthouse um, rental. Um, the, the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, the culture that I grew up in, I understood to be dying out partly because of the ravages of the Holocaust, of the genocide, but also because of um, the ways that that white flight had totally divested from dense Jewish Lower East Side culture. And meanwhile, um, while all this was happening, while my culture was dying out around me, um, my Puerto Rican neighbors um, who had been denied the ability to buy her own um, in the neighborhood um, because of systemic racism, right, redlining, and other factors um, were getting displaced en masse from the neighborhood. And my parents who bought into the neighborhood, we bought their apartment um, in I think 1983, our family's wealth was actually benefiting from this whole process. And, and this created a kind of tear in my soul. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 I saw my home dying around me. I saw people around me suffering far more materially while I myself was, was benefiting materially. It's, it's changed our family's fortunes, this process. All of these things made me say, this is not how it should be. This is not how it should be for my Puerto Rican neighbors. This isn't how it should be for our shoals um, that have been divested from. And this isn't how it should be for our Yiddish or Jewish culture, which has been so widely abandoned in the American context. And so for me, all of these things 
have, 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 have come together very naturally. I love being Jewish and I want to do that as much as I can and learn it as much as I can and fight for it. Um, and I also think that, that just, it doesn't work to do that without doing it with our neighbors next to us. At a very minimum, it, it, it's at a cost to, to, to our souls. <laughs> you know, if my neighbors are getting pushed out of their homes while my parents' home is, is gaining value. Um, and even more than that, I like the version of New York City in the Lower East Side where I'm actually living with next to my neighbors, getting to know them for years and years and decades. And that's actually only possible if there's also racial and economic justice. So those are things that, that, that all really drew me in um, to this work. And, and, and among other things, the Black Lives Matter uprising in 2014, which when I was living out in the California Bay Area was, was really thriving really agitated me to say, you know, what, what can I be doing about this? What's my own stake in this? This isn't just my past or my history, but this, 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 this Jewish fight for social justice, it matters to me now. Um, and, and from there, I got more and more involved, um, uh, including to this point of working for the Commission on Human Rights. Thank you, Jonah. Someone in the audience said amen to that. <laughs> Um, by the way, um, we're going to have a Q&A at the conclusion of the program, but feel free to start writing in with your questions and comments now so I can start collecting them uh, before the Q&A starts. Um, so this next question is for, for both of you. Um, and it's, what, it, what do you think is the specific, sorry, what is specific to the role of white Jews in advocating for social justice? Yeah. I. This is something that, that I think about a lot <laughs> as a white Jew advocates for social justice. So the first thing I want to say is it's the right thing to do, and that does matter. But often, something being the right thing to do isn't quite enough for us to do it, because there's so many things that take our attention, so many valuable things. Um, so I, 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 I first, I want, to, I want to answer that as a white person. What does it do, I, I, I mean this very seriously, what does it do to my soul as a white person to walk the streets in New York City or back when we used to ride the subways, to ride the subway and see person after person begging me for enough food so they can afford their lunch that day and how disproportionately time and time again that person is likely to be a person of color. What does it do to my soul to either give to that person or not give and go to my office and go home and have the comfort of my home or to live in the suburbs and not see it at all, right? What, what does it do to me? There's a deep erosion of my integrity, my decency, and my soul as a white person living in a semi-porous caste society every day, even with the best intentions on my part. And I'm tired of that. I'm tired of who it makes me to have to compromise and get numb again and again and again to how wrong things are while I get to lead a pretty decent life. The second thing is as a Jew, were you gonna say something, Anthony? No, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> You're on a roll, you should go okay. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. The second thing is, is as a Jew, and th this, this is a, a, more, a more complex argument, and it's one I'm still figuring out. I'll be curious what you all think of it. So, so it goes like this. As a Jew, I don't think that we're gonna be able to get free. And what I mean by free is something like, we get to continue our culture, we get to live our lives, we live peacefully with our neighbors, our, our basic needs are met. I don't think we're gonna be able to actually get free until everybody gets free. And the reason that I think this is because the thing that makes, that threatens all these things for Jews is anti-Semitism. And the way that I see anti-Semitism working is by saying anti-Semitism dehumanizes Jews and it blames us for everybody's problems, right? It dehumanizes Jews and it blames, everybody, it blames us for everybody's problems. And we've seen the dire consequences of it, the deadly consequences of that rise anew in this country in the last year or two. 
right? So given that that's the case, that, that the thing that, that most threatens my freedom as a white Jew is anti-Semitism dehumanizing me and blaming me for whether it's coronavirus or the economy or banks or immigration, whatever it is, I actually think it makes a huge difference if we build a society that humanizes people, right? right? In a society that dehumanizes people of color and immigrants and women and others, it just makes it that much more practiced and easy to go ahead and dehumanize Jews when it becomes politically expedient. So in a society that humanizes one another, in a society that has widely shared prosperity, a society that's equal. I mean, in the first three months of this pandemic, while 44 million Americans filed for unemployment, billionaires, American billionaires' net worth increased by $600 billion. Something's broken. While uh, a black person's uh, life on the streets may be hefker, may be uh, 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 devalued, abandoned, at total risk, God forbid, something is deeply and unequal and unsustainably wrong about how we're doing things in the society. And while that's the case, while there's these deep inequalities and anger and resentment that people may or may not be able to fully explain, those are the conditions under which people are more likely to blame Jews. And in a society where we build widely shared prosperity and where someone is um, not extra precarious, extra vulnerable, just because they're part of a minority, I think that's a society where Jews are much more likely to get free from anti-Semitism. So that's a very personal stake I have because I love being Jewish and I love Jewish people. And I think we're more likely to get free from this stuff that's making it hard to be a Jew if we actually live in a widely free and just society. It's, it's interesting because my take on this question is really informed by um, Jewish history. I think that cutting oneself off from the systemic oppression of a minority or minoritized people um, in which one is community in community with has a horrible, horrible precedence, both in the history of the 20th century in general, but it has a horrible precedent in Jewish history as well to not feel implicated by the oppression of people that you happen to be in community with. Um, I feel like in certain portions of the Jewish community, only portions, not the entire Jewish community. I don't talk about any community as a monolith and resent when people talk about my communities as a monolith. But in certain parts of the Jewish community, I think what Black people have to go through is kind of looked on as, to use a phrase, not goyesha naches, but like goyesha tsuris, right? It's their problem and it's unfortunate and it's bad for them. And it's horrible that it, it happens and it's sad that this history has happened, but it's over there and it's their issue and they need to deal with it the way that they deal with it. And we, there's, we're really not implicated by this, this goyish, goyish tsuris, right? It's hard for me to say because I don't even like it as an idea. Um, and then on the other end, we have this conceit that um, is counter to that and is also prevalent, which is that um, we've had um, racial justice action in our history. And because of that, we don't necessarily need to act um, on behalf of social justice, on behalf of racial justice, because we have that in our history. You know, we have um, MLK and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and the Northern Youth of Freedom Summer. And because of that, in some way, it, it ethnically absolves us from having to really do the work to be those people in this present time and in this present place. Um, I really want us to resist how easy it is to conflate the actions of very brave individuals from former times with our responsibility 
to act on behalf of minorities, to act on behalf of Black people today. I, I mean, I can be proud that uh, Rabbi Heschel marched with MLK, and I can also wonder, like, who are the Heschels today? I actually know uh, Rabbi Heschel's daughter, and she said to me um, over Shabbos dinner that people who aren't doing the work don't get to name check her father in conversations about racial justice. So there it is. Print it out, put it up on the wall, tell your friends. Like, we need to be out doing this work because it's important, it has been important, and it continues to be important. Thank you. Thank you guys for those powerful responses. Um, my next question is for Jonah again. Um, Jonah, can you tell us what you feel is at stake in social justice as Jewish New Yorkers? Yeah, I mean, look, New York, I think, is one of the great experiments in human history, in, in, in Jewish diasporic history, in global diasporic history, right? In, in its best version of itself, which is not only it's not only in its best version, but in its best version of itself, New York is a place where it's not a melting pot. pot. It's a place where a um, where, where hundred cultures and languages, hundreds can be together and neighbor one another and interact and create new things that haven't been seen before um, under the sun in terms of um, human culture and life and just neighborliness. It's New York itself is a deep reminder um, that, that this is actually as the world is. The world is a world of a thousand languages and a thousand faces and appearances um, and cultures and dress and histories. Um, and that's not a simple project, right? Because all of us who arrive here arrive with uh, often, often the histories of, 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 of colonial or anti-Semitic or genocidal violence that have driven many of us to come here or economic poverty. And we arrive in a place um, in, in a country that has, has had deep inequality from the start, genocide of native peoples mm -hmm. and subjugation of black people. So it's not a simple project. We have all that, that huge baggage to deal with with one another. But I do think what's at stake is you know, can New York be that best version of itself? Can, um, you know, when, when the, the spate of anti-Semitic assaults was happening in New York in the fall and winter, that was one of the biggest questions that I felt was at stake for the city, beyond the obviously very important questions, just people's physical safety um, and, and, and the ability of a community to feel safe. But can we do this project together? And I think that's also at stake with the, 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 the uprisings in New York City around violence um, uh, against Black people and disproportionate suffering of people of color in COVID is, can we do this thing together? Um, I believe so that the agency I work for, the Commission on Human Rights, we exist for that reason, to protect the human rights of, of New York minorities and to foster this kind of beautiful project of, of, of New York being together. So. So I, I feel like there's a, there's a lot at stake here and that, and that the, the country and the world actually does look to us to see, you know, can people really live together? Absolutely. Um, Anthony, uh, can you tell us what are things Jewish communities have that have effectively supported your leadership and your sense of belonging? It's been really interesting, um, this particular period of this year because I've been witness to and myself the beneficiary of efforts in the Jewish community to give Jews of color and especially black Jews outlets where our voices can be heard and opportunities for professional development and leadership within the largest Jewish community can happen. Over the past couple of months, I've been encouraged by the rise of Black voices in the Jewish press and the inclusion of Black Jews in communal conversations, not just about systemic racism, but just um, about Jewish life in general. It's um, the particular moment has invited me, and I've been invited by various exponents of the Jewish community to really kind of address um, what are the issues um, I happen to want to speak about as, as a Black Jew 
um, and that are important to me as a Black person. Anthony, are, are there moments where, where, where Shul or a Yiddish class or a summer program where, where something changed for you, where, where you felt some, some relief from the burden of racism in the room, some, some, some sense of solidarity and belonging? Or have you felt those moments in just sort of in Jewish community and, and what have they come to, to be? That's a really interesting question. I, I have, though, I'd say the moments where I felt the opposite are the ones that, of course, stay in the mind. But um, I have had the chance to be a part of various kind of iterations of Jewish community in ways that felt like there was a continuity uh, between who I am and who the community was. I was a part of the community. I'll say recently, um, I was a part of a retreat called Let My People Sing um, that happens in the Berkshires every year. This year, of course, it was online. Um, but I was uh, invited to come and speak to the retreat about what I saw as kind of the relationships between African American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. And the people there were so welcoming and so kind of ready to kind of experience um, my thoughts on the matter and share their thoughts on the matter that it really felt like a place where I was able to kind of fully be myself without kind of being this um, object of curiosity or having to justify why I was there. I was just merely there as a person uh, who was present to be in singing community with a bunch of other people who were also there to be uh, in singing community. I've been very lucky in that sense. Like a lot of the experiences that I've had that have been negative have um, not involved violence, Baruch Hashem, but were mostly micro to macro aggressions about people's kind of externalized ideas of what and who exists in Jewish space. And it's really interesting because I don't think um, it's something that a lot of people have consciousness around. Um, the fact that they're acting from preconceived notions of what Jewish space looks like. But um, I get to interact with what their concepts of what Jewish space looks like all the time, the minute I enter their Jewish space. So it's a complicated question. I do feel more optimistic about the possibilities of being, um, Black in Jewish space and not having Blackness be this ongoing issue or this source of um, aggression, macroaggression, microaggression. I have more hope about that just because of how, how much change I've already seen happen in such a, a short amount of time. And I desperately hope it's not temporary change, it's permanent change. Um, I feel the same way about really this historic moment, I hope it brings us permanent change in that the things that um, we've had to suffer and the things that uh, the coronavirus has laid bare are finally addressed. Thank you. Um, we have time for, for one more interview question and then I want to uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, and actually this next question, um, is for Jonah, Anthony, feel, feel free to respond as well. But um, th the question is, what concrete steps can Jewish institutions take to transform themselves to support racial justice? And in, in addition to Jewish institutions, what can we as individuals do? If, for example, you have um, uh, particular resources or organizations or anything that you can uh, recommend for people, I, I am happy to include links to resources in my follow-up email as well. So feel free to, to expand on that. Thank you so much, Samantha. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just glad to be on this call with, with both of you right now. I'm really, you know, Anthony, I, I really, 
I, I'm grateful for the way that you speak, speak from the heart and, 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 and with honesty and also kindness and care. Um, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit of a love fest, you should know. We both respect each other very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm one of those people who, who blushes very obviously, and I, 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 I sense that I'm doing that right now. Um, yeah, I, I, one of the things that you said, Anthony, um, really struck me, I mean, that you most recently said, which is that you feel more hopeful um, than you did a few years ago. And uh, from my perspective, one of the things that's changed in the Jewish communal world over, let's say the last three to five years, um, is a growing recognition of a fact that already existed, which is that uh, Jews don't always look like me or come from the places that I come from, that Jews can look a lot of ways and come from a lot of places, that our American Jewish communities include Jews of color and include Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews. And that these groups have been um, pushed to the margins. Their, their, their leadership and their cultures have been pushed to the margins. That's a bad thing that's been happening for a long time. The good thing is that there's been a growing recognition. I, I think that one of the, the things that's helped change that um, is, is actually the work of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, one of the um, co-presenters of this, um, this session we're doing now. Um, who really took the lead on saying as an organization and in, in their more public work and writing and saying, you know, Jews of color exist, you know, and, 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 and Jews of color suffer from, from racism. And if we're going to be Jews together, we need to work on that. Um, as well as a lot of other important organizations. So I, 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 I say that to say, I actually think a lot can actually change really quickly around this stuff. Um, and um, in terms of some of the specific things that, uh, that institutions can do, um, Jewish institutions still have an enormous amount of work to center the experiences of Jews of color, Sephardi, Mizrahi Jews, and build relationships with non-Jewish people of color. It's just an enormous amount of work to do. We, the beauty of being Jewish is that we, we're, we're, we're a close-knit people, but it risks insularity. And when combined with the fact that so many Jews are now white in America, um, that insularity can become a very white insularity. And that's affected a lot of our institutions, almost all of them. So some of the things that we can practically do to, uh, to address that, one thing I recommend that institutions do is start with a listening session for marginalized um, members of the organization, constituents, congregants, um, people that you serve, um, and say, you know, we need to hear, just listen, and what have been experience of Black Jews and other Jews of color been um, with our organization, and what are their needs, and just start from that place of recognizing we, we don't know unless, the, unless we ask. Another is bringing in professional help. There are a lot of really excellent anti-racist consulting organizations out there, um, including um, black and brown Jewish led ones um, that specialize in working with Jewish organizations and, and can help institutions come up with a process of saying, okay, from the ground up, we're gonna do a process of reflection and assessment on harms already done, on needs not yet met, and start to address those. Um, Another, another basic thing is, as appropriate, creating more platforms for, for leadership um, and genuine support, paid mentorship, paid support for um, Jews of color in the organization to actually take real leadership roles. If you're going to have a committee working on this stuff in your institution, actually have it represent, be, have it, uh, represent various constituents have real decision-making power and have it reflect the genuine diversity of the Jewish world, um, even if your institution doesn't yet fully do that. Um, on an institution, on an individual level, there's so much that we can do, whether it's attending a protest or if we're not able to do that, 
calling a congressperson, signing up for um, daily updates from Jews for Racial and Economic Justice or Workers Circle or um, other uh, uh, Jewish organizations working on racial and social justice to say, okay, here's the call I'm gonna make today. Here's the letter I'm gonna write today. Here's the friend I'm gonna invite to this uh, you know, virtual town hall on September 14th, Jews for Racial Economic Justice is actually having one. Um, so, it, you know, whatever, whatever it, it may be, um, there's actually an enormous, enormous amount that you, you can do as an individual. Um, and, and I guess one more, one more thing I'll add that's really important is we, we have a, a really rich tradition of tzedakah. You know, I, my personal practice, I try to give Meiser 10% a year. It's a really strong Jewish tradition of that. And there's Jewish teachings that we should be giving 20% or everything we have be because, because it doesn't belong to us. <laughs> you know, we might have it, but it doesn't belong to us. It's, it's something that's been given to us and, and we're just caretakers of to, to redistribute it more justly. So I think that's give, giving our, our tzedakah in, in really thoughtful, strategic ways to black and brown led racial justice organizations um, and building long-term relationships as volunteers um, for those organizations can be a really powerful way to grow our involvement as well. Um, as some people might know, I'm a Rebbitzin, um, so I'm going to pretend to be my husband for a moment, Rabbi Michael Rothbaum, and talk about the roots of the word tzedakah, which of course it's tzedek, meaning righteousness, meaning justice. So um, tzedakah really is a very impactful way to, to put your support in places where it is very much needed. Thank you for, both for those supremely thoughtful responses. We have a lot of really fascinating, complex, nuanced questions coming in and very limited time. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to uh, get to as many as I can. Um, so let's see here. So many to choose from. Um, this question just came in about Yiddish. Uh, you spoke at the beginning of the session about the potential for Yiddish to play a role in a richer anti-racist Jewish activism. Can either of you expand on that? I mean, I can speak, to, I, you know, we had a conversation about this earlier. I can speak to kind of historically uh, times in which the Yiddish language has touched on this. Um, it's really quite interesting. Um, so I think my reason uh, for thinking why Yiddish is actually pertinent in this particular context is that Yiddish speakers live in a modern world and the Black Lives Matter movement is a present and pressing subject of modern inquiry. And as such should be discussed in Yiddish as much as any other language, but also that the issues that the Black Lives Matter movement represents has already been the subject of inquiry in the Yiddish language in previous periods. Um, there's a Yiddish play called Mississippi, which was written by Leib Malach for an avant-garde theater troupe in Warsaw in the 1930s as a dramatic treatment of the famous Scottsboro Boys trial where nine black teenagers were falsely accused of rape by two white women in Alabama. Um, this was actually a very popular play and traveled all over the world. In 1965, uh, a poem was written called Vin Kvolt in Alabama Zine by Soviet Yiddish poet um, of the name of Yosef Kerler, where he imagines himself as a black man marching in Alabama as a radical act of Jewish solidarity with the civil rights movement. So we have these kind of historic examples of Yiddish discussing and engaging with contemporary issues that were happening in their respective times. And I don't think we should be any different in this particular time with Yiddish. Um, very quickly, I'd like to um, mention the translators who have been working on this and who've kind of brought it to my knowledge. Alyssa Quint, who's been working on the play uh, Mississippi and Maya Evrona, who recently translated this poem about Alabama by Kerler. Um, in addition to this, there's a history of black poets being translated into Yiddish, 
in the 1920s and 1930s. So there's these various um, sorts of engagements with the um, phenomena of Black life in the Yiddish language. It's not this kind of thing that's coming from outside of the language. You know, it's not like we showed up to Yiddish and we said like, you know, let us in. Ways of approaching the complications and the culture and the existence of Black life have existed in the Yiddish language. And, and here are just a few examples of, of, of how that has happened in the past. Amazing, thank you. Um, so may, uh, may, yeah. may I briefly respond as well? Of course. Um, so so um, Anthony is an artist, so he talked about art. And um, I'm an organizer, so I'll talk about politics. <laughs> um, I, I grew up. I grew up at, at, in a summer camp called Camp Kinderland, and there was a, a plaque on one of the, the walls, a very humble, handmade, hand-painted plaque that said that that memorialized the Camp Kinderland members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who had died. Um, in volunteering to fight uh, Franco's uh, fascist coup all the way over in Spain. And um, that history, a, a third of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade of these pe Americans who volunteered to go fight fascism um, in Spain, a third of them were Jewish. And uh, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade had some newspapers and, and, and Jewish newspapers were in uh, um, uh, uh, of the various brigades um, were, were in Yiddish. Um, and, and I would like us to think about what would it look like today for the Jewish community to have the kind of discipline and commitment and mass organization to justice that it took for a third of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade to be Jewish, to volunteer, to go risk their lives, and for many of them to lose it, fighting fascism um, across the Atlantic. Um, this is our rich history. Um, and, and the actual access to that history can often be done through Yiddish. As I said, their newspapers are in Yiddish. You wanna read what it was like to be there? You know, gotta read it in Yiddish. And if you want to read it in translation, you need to know it's been translated and what people choose to translate has been filtered. Some of these histories have been erased. Um, and whether or not you speak Yiddish, it carries a symbolic history. The history of the fight for a 40 hour work week in this country is also a Yiddish fight. The fight for the Abraham Lincoln Brigades you know, against fascism, that was a Yiddish fight. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, that was also a Yiddish fight. And so for even for those of us who don't speak Yiddish, there's something very much at stake of saying, is that our history still? And, and if we can say that, if we can talk about racial justice and Black Lives Matter in Yiddish today, it means that we are also living that Yiddish history now, right? that there is, despite all the breaks, there is some form of continuity too. And that that's our resource. Those histories of courage and organization, um, those are our histories that we can also access today. We're Jews, we can't yeah. really afford to take historical resources lightly. <laughs> well said. Um, so Staying on the, this very interesting subject of Yiddish and social justice and the intersection of the two, we have a question here um, from a viewer about how can you weigh, how do you weigh the meaning of translating Black Lives Matter into Yiddish against a critique that such, translate, that such a translation is somehow elitist and will ultimately only circulate among Yiddishists? Um, and forgive me, I don't know, I don't speak Yiddish, so I don't know these words, but um, he gives the example of the Hasidic community not, not using um, blitz post or blitz breathe. I'm not sure what that means, but perhaps you can speak to it. Uh, can I take the first crack at this, Anthony? Please. So first of all, blitz post and blitz breathe are neologisms coined by uh, Yiddish speakers 
outside the Hasidic community to just talk about email. Um, in, in Hasidic Yiddish, the way you say email is email. So then, you know, what, 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 what we're pointing to here is that there, there's two divergent Yiddish speaking communities today. The, the larger and, and certainly more growing one is a Hasidic native Yiddish speaking community. And then um, there, there's uh, people like me who, you know, I, I had exposure to Yiddish growing up, but in order to recover it, I had, I had to study and study it in, in Yiddish programs. Um, and that, that's true of both Anthony and I, one of her partners, our own is a native Yiddish speaker, but, but runs in our, our more academic circles. Um, so I, I actually, I, I, one thing I will say is I am not out here trying to tell Hasidim how to say this stuff in Yiddish um, because um, I'm not inside that community. I have some relationships, but I'm not gonna trying to prescribe it. I'm, this is something that I've tried to do for the Yiddish community I'm part of. The second thing is, I actually think we have to thank Hasidim in some part for some of the lingual decisions or solutions we arrived at, including transcribing Black Lives Matter as Black Lives Matter into Yiddish. That's actually a very American Hasidish uh, approach is actually working with the surrounding language. Um, I just want to say yeah. really quickly, so we put a lot of work into this document and a lot of the questions that I'm seeing is how do you say this and it actually happens to be in the document. So I really want to invite people to view the document themselves. The contents of the document are the various phrases we've been talking about in English, in Yiddish Oisius, so in Hebrew letters and in transliteration. Um, and you can pretty much find everything there. This really um, dovetails nicely with um, what you were saying, Yoina, which is that this document did not or was not produced um, with the dimensions of a diktat, right? The, the idea was not that we were definitively making decisions about the Yiddish language that were going to be dictated to the rest of all Yiddish speakers. We're merely trying to create for ourselves a vocabulary with which to speak about these things. Um, and in order to sort of free up conversation about this very pressing matter. Um, it encouraged me actually to do some of the first writing in Yiddish I've ever done. I would call myself very cautiously an intermediate speaker of Yiddish, um, but I sat down um, empowered by kind of what this document meant and the fact that I had it at my disposal I sat down and I wrote an op-ed for Ingeveb, which is um, an academic journal about the responsibility of, of people who like to sing songs in Yiddish about social justice, the responsibility of those people to do justice. It is a lot of fun to sing um, the Loi Police, but like, what are you actually doing in your community about how the police interact with people who live in your community, with people of color in your community. Like in, in the uh, op-ed, I said, you know, it's great to sing um, Deloy Police because they're talking about the czar's police. Well, the czar's police don't really mean anything anymore. Like I'm talking about the police. Um, so I just really wanted to be, be known that we were not trying to dictate to Yiddish speakers en masse um, or I should say off the ganze Welt, uh, um, uh, how to talk about these things. Um, and I want people to know that even the decisions we made were not necessarily definitive, that there have been changes and there continue to be changes. Um, Afro-Americaner as a way of, of translating black is complicated as a concept. And there have been people who have taken it upon themselves to actually sort of um, translate or retranslate that in a way that makes more sense in their particular context. I saw a protest sign that said afro Canadair, right? Black Canadian. Um, there's still a lot of like things that we're trying to work out because 
I think in the beginning it was really important for me to use Afroamericaner in the place of Black because I saw this as being essentially a, an American movement, but it's a global movement. And the things that are issues for Black people in the United States are issues for people all over the world. So we're still in the middle of trying to develop language around these things. This was not, like I said, uh, dictated to a community of Yiddish speakers. This was for our use. This was for our ability. This was to facilitate conversation. There was really no elitism involved. I don't consider myself to really be elite of anything, really. Um, I'm always looking for a deeply Hamish conversation and I will try to use whatever I happen to have at my disposal in order to approach this Hamishness. It shouldn't come from the top down, it should come from the bottom up. Jonah, um, did you want to finish your thought or can we take one more question? Uh, all of it should be machlaikis l'shem shemayim. All, all of this wonderful argument that, that Jews have should be, as we say, for the sake of heaven, but you know, for, for, for moving the work forward. I, I like disagreeing with Jews as long as we're, we're moving things forward. It only means something if there can be a disagreement about it. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so we're just about out, out of time, but I want to take one more question since so many are coming in. Um, and you touched on this, uh, I forget who it was who touched on this briefly earlier in our conversation, but um, one of our viewers asks, how does this all connect with what some call Ashki normativity in mainstream American Jewish communities? For example, the suppression and or loss of Sephardi, Mizrahi, and other Jewish ethnic cultures, languages, etc. It's really interesting because I think as a highly visible person um, on a Yiddish scene, I would not say the Yiddish scene, um, oftentimes a sort of Ashkenaz, Ashkenazi chauvinism is uh, <laughs> attached to me because I, I do kind of take part in Ashkenazi culture very performatively, but I'm actually um, very much a supporter of real Jewish diversity. That is a diversity of practice. That is a diversity of language. That is a diversity of ethnicity. That is who I am. That is what I am about. I do not assume that the act of translating Black Lives Matter into Yiddish is some kind of panacea to worldwide Jewry. It is not. Yiddish is not a language that applies to various kinds of Jews, and I don't have any feelings about that. I really don't. Um, I love the diversity of Jewish culture, and I really want to get away from um, a paradigm of Ashka normativity, and I want things to be specific. I actually want things to come from a place. I want them to smell and sound and taste like the places that they are from. I don't want it to be this kind of automatic setting of culture, of Jewish life. I want more. I always want more. I never want less. So Ashkenormativity to me is a very complicated sort of concept that does not exactly, for me, fit the phenomena of how American Jews perform their Jewishness. But um, I would say I am very much against kind of what it represents. Um, to use a word from another language, I find it alarmingly basic, a basic way of being Jewish in the world I always want more specificity. I want more languages. I want more practice. I want more ethnicities. Uh, I want more of everything. Beautifully said. Jonah, do you have anything to add or? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly say, you know, look, Anthony and I couldn't have done this project if we hadn't spent summers studying Yiddish in um, different summer programs across the world. And as, 
as attenuated as the world of Yiddish has been by, by genocide and by the pressures to assimilate in America and elsewhere. Um, also, why, why, why don't we have those kinds of programs for our Sephardi um, comrades to be studying Yiddish, I mean, <laughs> And there you go, Ashkenazi activity to be studying Ladino all across the world, you know, um, if they want to be, or or Judeo Arabic, or Judeo Greek, or so many of the the, the rich uh, lingual traditions that we have, and 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 I, I I think that does go back to, you know, can we transform our Jewish communities to genuinely reflect the diversity, the racial and ethnic diversity of Jews as we actually are, recognizing the beauty of that, and really supporting our different, really diverse Jewish cultures to grow. I want to be in a world where um, there's really vibrant Latino and other programs, and where um, people of Sephardi heritage or who have gone into that heritage are empowered to be doing their own kind of work in this kind of way with that. And, and, and that's an obligation I have as a white Ashkenazi Jewish person is to make my institution supportive of them so they can do whatever they want with their culture. It's perverse for there to be so much lip service about the diversity of the Jewish people, which is often mobilized as a defense against racism and then to find the diversity of the Jewish people not even honored amongst Jews themselves. Like, I'm not about it. Um, there needs to be more. Yeah, we, we need to walk the walk. Okay. Um, maybe we all strive for, for more diversity and acceptance. Um, thank you both so much for this tremendously fascinating and important conversation. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions that we had come in, but um, all the more reason for, for people to continue to check out those resources. I will include links to JFredge and our other partners, uh, Worker Circle, and the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and my follow-up email, in addition to a link to the recording of today's program, and also um, the websites where you can read more about Jonah and Anthony and possibly get in touch with them. Um, thank you both again. This was so tremendous. I, I really can't thank you enough. Bleibt gesund und stark. Amen. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Anthony and Samantha, and to the museum. And, and thank you to everyone for coming. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. All right, with that, signing off. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.